Good evening. The March 18, 2019 meeting of the Anne Arundel County Council is now in session. Please stand for the invocation and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Vice Chairwoman Councilman, or Councilwoman Pickard will lead us in the invocation. Oh God, we pray to administer that which is just in all policies. Being ever mindful of your guidance, stir us to action with love, wisdom, and understanding. Amen. Amen. For the Pledge of Allegiance, we actually have uh, Troop 759 from my home community in Odington. If you guys would come forward, please, uh, and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Turn around up here, guys, towards the flag, and then whenever you're ready. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you again to Troop 769. They're here for their communications and uh, citizenship merit badges. And uh, Mr. McConaughey, one of the troop leaders, and other folks and parents are here. We welcome you. Uh, Madam Secretary, could you please read the ethics statement? The Ethics Commission is asked that I advise you that under certain circumstances, members of the public may qualify as lobbyists when they testify before the County Council. If so, the law requires that certain information be filed with the Ethics Commission. The Chairman of the Ethics Commission is asked that those present review the Ethics Commission information in the foyer of these chambers. If there are any questions about lobbying requirements, speakers should contact the Ethics Commission in the Heritage Office Complex on Reaver Road. Thank you, Madam Secretary. We'll now move to the invitation to audience. We're going to invite members of the audience who signed up before the meeting to address the council briefly on any subject not included in the printed agenda. And remarks are limited to two minutes. Um, I'd ask that uh, everyone that comes forward to state your name and address for the record. So we will go to the list. Uh, Mr. Patrick Enright, Mr. Mark Zablotny, and Ms. Jamore uh, Mackle. If you would come forward, please. And again, Mr. Enright, whenever you're ready, name and address, and uh, we'll go forward. Thank good you. E good evening, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the council, ladies of the staff. My name is Patrick Enright, uh, Huntwood Drive in Gambrels, Maryland. I wish to quickly uh, address a point of, uh, of uh, law in existing code, Anne Arundel County, specifically, now everybody grab your pens. Article, Article 17, um, Title 5. Section 901, subsection H. In the first sentence, I would like to see the word may change to shall. In doing this, and this may, this conundrum I see from you know permissive to mandating uh, may exist in other parts of the code. I'm just taking this particular instance out uh, to point this out. May to shall. Uh, addresses a number of issues uh, from vagueness in law to, to uh, comporting with uh, requirements and with the law and contracts and so forth. And I think that this should be um, uh, examined by you folks uh, because I think it would protect uh, actors that in the county doing business, uh, the county, county itself, and the citizens that are affected by business in the county. Um, I think that uh, compacts, contracts, agreements, and so forth um, may, uh, you know, be in the best interest of all parties uh, considered. So I would ask you to look at that and uh, and see what you think. And then if it applies to other uh, such uh, words in the code, then so be it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blatney. Yeah. Is this one? Yeah. Oh, got it. Okay. Mark Zablotny here, 1050 Carriage Hill Parkway. Got a cold. Just got back from Peru. Anyway, uh, gosh, it's nice to see all these new faces on and the year of the woman. Anyway, uh, I'd like to talk about traffic tonight. Uh, you know, traffic's getting a little bit heavy around the Annapolis area, and there's one place, there's a couple of things that could be done, I think. One of them is, uh, if you're familiar with the, uh, where Reaver Road meets uh, West Street, right at where the uh, Mission Barbecue is, 
It used to be able to go through there all the way to Route 50. They closed it off. Now you have to make a right turn and then make a left turn on Route 2. But they never fixed the light there. So people sit there for 30 seconds for no reason. When they could just, if they could turn that light, you could clear a lot of traffic there in 30 seconds. The other thing, um, my mom's 96. And I have to, she'll be 96 on May 20th. I have to take her to the, she likes to go to BJ's and Aldi's and all these things up in Pasadena. <laughs> anyway, uh, she, uh, when I pick her up, we go to, I always, I always get stopped. I think there's a micro switch in my car that stops me at the Safeway on uh, Route 2 and Arnold. But after that, we go, we hit a green light all the way, even through a malfunction junction in Severn Park. Don't make a single stop, it's consistent. The other night, for whatever reason, she was on a ladder and she fell, and I had to take her to the emergency room. And that ladder's out of the house, by the way. And uh, I came back on uh, Route 50 to Best Gate. No traffic anywhere, no cars anywhere. You stop at three of the six lights. And I don't understand why they can't, in this computer age, you can't fix something like that. And also, if I don't know how to do it, just to talk about fixing some of these other mistakes in the traffic lights. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mackle. Kill Nine Bun Street, right here in Annapolis. Um, I've been going around the county uh, visiting um, town hall meetings and everything, and um, I hear that road construction and all that like that, how to get funding for um, schools projects and everything. And I was wondering, is the council aware about um, contractors who's not paying their fair dues and county taxes, late, mainly labor, labor brokers who work for some of these contractors. So therefore, the labor brokers get paid in cash. So therefore, the county or the state is not receiving the proper taxes from, from these companies and everything. And um, wondering what is the um, body is doing about it um, to learn more about the situation because it's like over I think a um, hundred and four million dollars that the state lose out every year on this so I'm um, wondering um, what y'all doing about it and um, if y'all want to research a little bit more of it you can go to um, stoplabelbrokers.com and um, will tell you exactly what the federal and state is um, losing with these companies out here using labor brokers and um, basically um, cheating, cheating the state. And that's it. Great. Thank you. This group's dismissed. Yeah. Uh, is there anyone who didn't sign up to wish to speak? Please come to the table. State your name and address for the record. I see Ms. Johnson. Anyone else? Last call. Julie Johnson with PO Box 6634, Annapolis, Maryland. Um, I think you've probably grown tired of hearing about one of this, one of the most important Supreme Court to, uh, cases that I've been trying to tell you about for a series of meetings. It began in 1982 with an, a botched armed robbery and a murder, separate cases. Um, and then this came to the Supreme Court and the decision was handed down in 2011. So you're looking at basically 30 years. So no wonder I can't get it condensed to, to two minutes. But I want to tell you, first of all, that in my opinion, this is one of the very, very worst decisions ever handed down by the Supreme Court. It is generally not spoken of very often. Essentially, the man who was accused and convicted, a man named John Thompson, was absolutely innocent. The prosecutors were divided up in, in a pair of two teams of two, and they withheld evidence. Some evidence disappeared altogether. Uh, they didn't disclose evidence for, de for the defense. And so as he, we went through, through appeals, you know, nobody came forward and told, told what they did until 1995, when one of the four prosecutors was dying. He, um, he went to the office and he said, this is what we did. I don't want this man to be executed. The information was still withheld. And in 2000, finally, the, you know, the, all of his ex you know, appeals were exhausted. He was going to be executed. And the Innocence Project had an investigator there who found the, the, the blood, the, a, a blood test that showed that his blood type did not match you know, the, you know, the, the, existing, the, the, record, the evidence from the scene of the crime. 
Mr. Mr. Johnson, please summarize. Okay. And so when the Supreme Court justices got it, Scalia and Thomas said, it doesn't matter that all this was, was done. Um, he, the, the fact that the jury said he should get $18 million, excuse me, four, $14 million, a million for each year on, on death row, basically in isolation. Thank, thank you, Ms. Johnson. Okay. All right. The invitation to audience is now closed. Um, is there any item uh, any council member would like to place on the agenda? Um, I do have two things. Uh, the administration is withdrawing bill number 819 uh, as a part of the record and um, Councilwoman Fiedler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to take a moment of uh, councilmanic privilege here. Uh, about two weeks ago, um, Kenny Elgert, who is, um, for lack of a better word, the mayor of Severna Park, um, passed away unexpectedly. Um, he uh, was a nonverbal individual. Sorry, I personally knew him. Um, who was very able to communicate, whether it be a giant or in the stands at the high school games. Um, Kenny will be inducted into the Severna Park High Athletics Hall of Fame on April 5th. And I just wanted to recognize Kenny. He was a huge part of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Fiedler. Um, preliminary motion, may I have a motion that partial reading of any bill, resolution, or amendment to a bill, resolution, or minutes constitutes the reading of the whole? Is there second. A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? The motion carries. Madam Secretary, please read the minutes of March 4th. 2019. The meeting was called to order by Chairman Prusky at 7 p.m. and opened with the invocation given by Ms. Lacey, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of March 4, 2019? So Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? No, the motion carries. Minutes of March 4, 2019 stand approved as read. Madam Secretary, please read the titles of the bills to be introduced this evening. Bill number 1619, an ordinance concerning Cape Ann Special Community Benefit District approval of loan agreement. Bill number 1719, an ordinance concerning public works utilities allocation of water and wastewater capacity. Bill number 1819, an ordinance concerning public works utilities charges and assessments for water and wastewater. Bill number 1919, an ordinance concerning purchasing, procurement, minimum bid li limits. Bill number 2019, an ordinance concerning zoning, tattoo parlors, and body, body piercing salons. Bill number 2119, an ordinance concerning zoning, community-based assisted living facilities. Madam Secretary, please read the title of the resolutions to be introduced this evening. Resolution number 1119, resolution approving the application to establish a BRAC revitalization and incentive zone within the boundaries of Odenton Town Center. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Now we're going to move the portion of public hearing on bills and resolutions for final reading and vote. Uh, Madam Secretary, please read the title of Bill 719 as amended. Bill number 719 is amended, an ordinance concerning zoning, licensed premises for licensed dispensaries, growers, and processors of medical cannabis. Great. Uh, Ms. Pickard is the sponsor. Uh, I don't know if you wanted to make a few remarks. Um, well, we've, this is the second time this bill's been before this body. Um, we, I do have an amendment that I'm bringing forward tonight. Is this the appropriate time to do that? We'll wait till that time. Yeah. Okay. The administration, do you have anything to add uh, to this? Bill, before we open up public hearing. Uh, for the record, Pete Barron with uh, the county executive. With me at the table is Ms. Rhodes and Mr. Swain. Um, no, I think we've, we've talked about this bill at a work session and we've, we've had it before us. Uh, the administration, just to reiterate, the administration supports this bill as amended. Um, I'll comment on the amendments at uh, the appropriate time. Thank you. Uh, so we will now open the public hearing. Remarks will be limited to two minutes. Um, we do have some folks who signed up. Same process. If you come forward, state your name and address for the record. Um, we'd appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Zablotny and uh, Ms. Benecourt Johnson are the two that I have signed up for 719. Oh, got it, thanks. Mark Zablotny again, 1050 Carriage Hill Parkway, Annapolis. Uh, 
I'm here representing the uh, General Highway Council of Civic Association, 32 communities, approximately 9,100 residents. And I've been in constant contact with them all weekend for the last week, just talked to a lot of people. Um, let me put my glasses on here. These are the general ideas that I've, I've been getting from everybody, and this is, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, they want to make the point that the W-2 designation special exceptions could be, should be reinstated in accordance with the W-1, W-3, and C-1 zoning. That many general highways uh, residents have, have contacted the county council. I know that I've gotten quite a few emails that I was, I was CC'd on. Uh, that what They're asking for an amendment which reinstates the special exception uh, required for W-2 zones. That the prior council eliminated the special exemption to facilitate one specific uh, dispensary uh, kind of therapeutics and should be realigned to conform with the rest. Uh, there are currently 46 open dispensaries and 56, these are dispensaries that are already open, and 56 pre approved. That's 102. Let's put that in perspective for a second. In all the state of Maryland, there's 52 Panera breads. There's only 81 Chick fil A restaurants in Maryland. So, I mean, this, is, this seems like it's a lot of overkill. Having this many dispensaries, uh, and we also they also say that some major planning should go into the selection of locations, locations for the dispensaries, especially when you have a, a huge traffic problem like we have down at, where, where kind of therapeutics is going at the end of General's Highway. It's a mess already. It's a filled intersection. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Betancourt Johnson. Good evening, esteemed council members, and thank you for allowing me to present and provide testimony to you today on bill number 719. Um, having grown up here, actually, in, in an economically disadvantaged community, in a majority minority community, I, serve for, I saw firsthand how the war on drugs disproportionately affected my community and my neighborhood. The criminalization of marijuana influenced the mass incarceration of entire generations, not only in my neighborhood, but across the U.S. and in particularly here in Maryland. It's with that context in mind that I committed my life to rebuilding economically disadvantaged communities and providing opportunities for those who live in them. I've served as a board member to the largest inmate reform program in the U.S. I've served as the board chair to the region's largest nonprofit advocacy association. And most recently, I served as the executive director of Rebuilding Together, an affordable housing organization that revitalizes homes and the lives of some of our most vulnerable populations. It was in that role that I became more sensitive to the health needs of clients that I served, and particularly the value of medicinal marijuana. In 2018, I founded Rooted Therapeutics, a Maryland-based minority and woman-owned business here in Maryland, and in 2019, I formed a joint venture in pursuit of the intended cultivation and processing licenses targeting minorities here in the state. While there are a number of counties that I'd like to go into and locate our business, I've chosen to build my business here in the state of Maryland and in Anne Arundel County, specifically under your leadership and that of County Executive Pittman's. I truly believe that this county is open to business, and with a highly educated and skilled workforce, I really want to be here. We have a central location as well, but quite frankly, we need favorable zoning in order to set up our shop. It's with that request that I ask that you seriously consider the amendments before you, and I support them and ask that you do too. It's critically important in order for us to be a successful business that's up and running. Please con summarize. Contributing to the tax revenue and the workforce development here in the county that we have favorable conditions in which we can operate and build our businesses. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, is there anyone who did not sign up and wish to speak at this time for uh, the public hearing on bill number 719. I see some movement in the crowd. Yeah. <clears throat> Ms. Johnson. Um, Julie Johnson, P.O. Box 6634, Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, I came forward to speak in support of uh, Mark Zablonski's testimony. Um, back in ancient history, I served on the Crownsville Small Area Planning Committee, um, and I was the um, 
I was actually the chairman of the uh, outreach com uh, committee, and we literally went door to door th through a very large area. We, we canvassed a lot. We had public meetings, and people were very, very concerned about preserving the rural and historic area of um, Generals Highway in particular, and the surrounding communities. And they were very, very concerned about the traffic burdens, particularly at, at that intersection uh, with Bestgate Road and, and Generals Highway. Um, and so there's a long history of strong opposition you know, for that whole corridor that has since been developed. And so I would simply like to reemphasize that from personal contact from a lot of people who reside in that community, um, the, the feelings are heartfelt because of the, the traffic issues. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is Richard Smith. I live and work and have a business in District 6. And I've been following the cannabis legislation for about a year and a half at this point. And I'd like to say that, that I, along with I think probably everyone in this room, has been very moved by a lot of the testimonies. And I don't think anybody would deny medicine or wanting to help an epileptic child or a grandparent who's in hospice. And I think certainly we all want to do these things. And I don't think the legislation is about that. Um, I would like to suggest, though, that it's possible to advocate for the needy and still to maintain reasonable legislation that appeals to the needs and the concerns of the constituents. I don't think it's an either or kind of proposition. And I think it's possible, maybe because we heard some extremism last year, that we're going too far in the opposite direction now. And I noticed that this is bill number seven, and this is a brand new council, and um, I think this reflects the enthusiasm and, and your desire to make a mark, and I commend you for that. But Ms. Pickard informs me that this is the youngest and um, most educated county council we've had in a really long time, if ever. So I realize there's been a lot of work put into this already, but um, my challenge or my request would be to determine how we could find something even better, something that allows Mr. Volke and Ms. Pickard and um, Ms. Rodvian and everyone to be satisfied, if not to actually smile. I think that there's an opportunity for a third alternative, something where maybe um, this very well-educated and very smart uh, council, along with maybe some help from the community, could come together and find something that works for everybody and that doesn't make anyone feel alienated. So that's my request and my challenge, along with my gratitude for all you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, the public hearing, on, thank you, uh, on Bill number 719 as, as amended is now closed. Uh, Madam Secretary, could you please read the title of Bill 719 as amended? Bill number 719 is amended, an ordinance concerning zoning, licensed premises of licensed dispensaries, growers, and processors of medical cannabis. Okay, is there any other uh, discussion? Administration, anything to add? Okay. Uh, we do have uh, two amendments. So, Madam Secretary, please read amendment number four. Amendment number four. This amendment applies to licensed premises of licensed dispensaries of medical cannabis and requires that one, the residential distance, distance restriction is measured from the primary entryway of a facility to the lot line of a lot located in a residential district that contains a dwelling unit, and two, the school distance restriction is measured from the lot line of a facility to the lot line of school property. Is there a motion to adopt amendment number four? Motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, uh, Ms. Pickard, this is uh, your amendment. I don't know if you wanted to say a few words. Sure. Um, my colleagues will remember that during our first work session, it was brought to my attention that we drafted the bill. Um, uh, I, in, in the draft of the first initial draft of the bill inadvertently changed uh, the county code in relationship to schools. So then we made an amendment at the last meeting that passed unanimously to take that back. But in taking it back, we also changed the intended purpose of the residential setback. So this, this is one last crack at getting this right. And uh, ultimately, the goal uh, in the residential setback was to reduce it to 500 feet um, within um, a residential district, capital R, capital D. So if you'll, you know, this is 
you know, pertaining to the northern part of the county where our commercial and residential areas commingle, and it's an older part of our, our county. So we have uh, along our major thoroughfares, Crane Highway, Ritchie Highway, we have um, numerous dwelling units that are possibly operating as insurance companies that are on C3 property. And so the ultimate goal of the setback is to protect, uh, is to provide that buffer between a neighborhood or an apartment complex, not necessarily the one-off dwelling unit that is um, sitting in commercially zoned with the 7-Eleven next door and the, the liquor store on the other side. So this is just to be very, very clear to the folks who are going to be administering during our code of where we're trying to allow our um, dispensaries to locate. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to. It is, it's funny how the, the code was originally written that the two school, public schools and residential dwellings got caught up in the same section, so we've had to break it out. So I apologize for the, the um, second amendment to fix my first mistake. Okay, why don't we hear for the administration, then we'll go to the council members. Uh, Mr. Barron. Uh, for the record, Pete Barron with the administration. Uh, we support the amendment. Um, uh, we supported the last one. I appreciate um, Councilwoman Pickard uh, working to make this even clearer. Okay, thank you, Councilwoman Hare, and then uh, Councilman Volke. I just want to make sure I understand, and I think maybe Ms. Rhodes, you can answer this. I, and I think maybe Ms. Pickard just said this, but so if there's a residential property or a residential development even on a C3 or a C2 lot, under this amendment there is no setback at all from a dispensary. Is that accurate? Correct. If there is a multifamily dwelling in a C3, they would not be subjected to the restricted area Okay. the distance. It would okay. be for the residential district Only. with the dwelling unit. Okay. All right. Thank you. Councilman Pavoki. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Pickard, I will ask you this question. <laughs> um, so I guess my understanding of the amendment is that this will now measure the distance as opposed to what we had done in the last meeting where it's lot line to lot line. This is now just a straight line calculation. So if a building is 200 feet back on a, a lot line, you'll measure from the entrance of the building to whatever the closest residential area. Is that right? Yes. Okay. All right. So this moves, this could theoretically move a dispensary even closer to a residential dwelling. Um, technically, yes. But when you know where we're talking about here, mm -hmm. we're not, we're talking about properties on Crane Highway, Ritchie Highway, and, and Furnace Branch Road. We're not talking about 10-acre tracts of land. Well, but those aren't the only parcels that would be covered by this. I mean, if you had a shopping center that had <clears throat> some sort of uh, facility and it was more than 500 feet away from a residential area and it was zoned appropriately, um, that could be it. Even if it was less than 500 feet away but it was set back far enough, that could still be in this. So it's not it's not only the Crane Highway Corridor or the Route 3 Corridor that this would affect. It would, it would affect the countywide. Well, it doesn't affect countywide because we've determined that we only uh, we only have conditions gotcha. on on um, north of fifty. Nor north of fifty, right. which has is created a, a good bit of inequity in how we apply this. So let's be clear on where we're talking about. Um, well, but, my district's included in this. Yes. Okay. But uh, it's not countywide <clears throat> right, because right, we okay. have a very right. bizarre code and how we handle medical cannabis, cannabis dispensary. And I would like to remind my colleagues and everyone listening that most counties in the state of Maryland have deemed medical cannabis dispensaries as pharmacies and growers and processors as manufacturers and allow them permitted use to locate wherever those types of businesses can locate. Anne Arundel County has chosen to be extremely prohibitive and we are stalling business from being able to operate and therefore decreasing access, patient access. So this is trying to get our remaining dispensaries to locate in the very commingling 
commingled commercial and residential areas in districts 32 and 31. So that is the point of being very clear in our code so that it's not left up to interpretation um, in planning and zoning. Okay, and um, so I guess the other piece of this is the 500 foot straight line measurement is also still subject, I, I don't know if I should direct this to you or to planning and zoning, but it's still subject to a variance. So obviously if you were 440 feet or 450 feet, but you know, you made the case to the hearing officer, it's feasible that you could wind up locating a dispensary even closer than 500 feet in a straight line. Am I understanding that right? Well, that's, a, that's at the discretion of a administrative hearing officer. Okay. So it would be, it would be ideal if folks could actually meet the conditions that we set about in the code. And then, you know, this is also by special exception. So let's also rem remind my colleagues that this isn't conditional use. This is, they, they have to meet these conditions and then present their case to the administrative hearing officer, which allows for public input into that process as well. So we're still extremely restrictive in how we're dealing with these businesses. We have piled on regulation to an already highly regulated industry. So we're talking about more regulation and less property rights here. It's pretty interesting that I'm having this conversation with my colleague. Um, but that's where we are tonight. So, <laughs> and that's where we are right here in 2019 in Anne Arundel County with this issue. But we, um, we, have to, we have to loosen these restrictions. And these are, you know, we are breaking this code open this much. Um, like I said, it's permitted use in the rest of the state. And um, it's just mind boggling that we're even having this conversation to me. But. That's all I have. Thank you. Any uh, further discussion? I, I do have one question for the law office because I actually had a constituent email me. Um, Mr. Swain, you know, when we look at this amendment and other things in the code, um, it talks about uh, medical cannabis, um, you know, listed. But there was a concern raised, well, what if it becomes recreational in the state? What if it's not a thing because it's not here? And number two, my understanding is that medical cannabis is what's uh, specifically stated in the code. Am I correct? So that people can't make an assumption is that what you see now, if it were switched, would change. Can you, can you clarify that for us? Sure. Greg Swain, county attorney. The, um, I mean, first of all, rec if recreational comes, it will garner a lot of attention, um, and there'll be a comprehensive review, and we'll revisit possibly these regulations as well. Mm -hmm. But right now, um, the only we use the term medical cannabis because that's what the state uses. Sure. This is all generated by state licensing, um, so it's not. There's certainly no. Uh, I, I know in the administration's view, there's no commingling of those two, and if and when that comes, we'll certainly take a comprehensive look at it. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other further discussion? Okay, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number four. Ms. Pickard. Aye. Mr. Volke? No. Ms. Fiedler? Nay. Ms. Rodvian? Aye. Ms. Hare? No. Ms. Lacey? Aye. Mr. Pruski? Aye. Four in the affirmative, three in the negative. Amendment number four is adopted. Madam Secretary, please read amendment number five. Amendment number five. This amendment removes licensed premises of licensed dispensaries of medical cannabis as a special exception use in C1 commercial districts. Okay, do we have a motion to adopt? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Mr. Volke, this is your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this amendment um, would remove from the bill the ability to place a medical cannabis dispensary in a C1 commercial district. I have some serious concerns about locating these types of businesses in C1, particularly because C1 is our lowest classification of commercial usage. Uh, these tend to be sort of commercial or neighborhood shopping centers. Um, a lot of times they are in a largely residential area. And my concern is that with the amendment that we've just passed right now, that 
instead of, just so everybody understands, what we had done previously, what this bill said before we just amended it, is that we would look at the edge of your property and we would go to the edge of the next property and we would measure and that would need to be at least 500 feet. What we've just done now is we've taken away those property lines and we've now said we're going to measure from the front door of this facility to whatever the lot line is of the residential unit. So if you have a building that is sitting 50 or 100 or 200 feet off the lot line, well, you're already 200 feet away from the residential unit right there. You only need to get another 300 feet. And if you're kind of close, but you're not exactly there, well, now we've, in this bill, reinstated a variance provision that says you can go to the administrative hearing officer and ask that you be allowed permission to locate there, even though you can't meet all of the requirements. So to me, what we've done is when we open up C1 and we have the variance requirement uh, reinstated, or, or the variance permission, excuse me, reinstated, and we have now shortened up the lot line distances, we've really opened up a whole lot of new areas that these facilities can locate. And frankly, I'm extremely concerned about locating them in C1. These are places that are close to your house. If you, you know, go on to the Anne Arundel County zoning map viewer, you can look around and you can see what's zoned C1 and where it sits in basically, um, basically in, in Proximity, that's the word I want, proximity to your home. Um, for instance, you know, Long Hill Shopping Center, which is in my district down toward the end of Mountain Road, uh, there's that, that's a C1 zoned area. So you could now wind up having a medical cannabis dispensary there if you can meet some of the requirements. And if you can't, you can still turn around and you can say, well, I'd like to uh, have a variance granted for this and the hearing officer can give it to you. I'm extremely concerned about that. So that is why I've asked for this to be stricken from the bill. I will tell you that I had an opportunity to review the legislative history from 2015 when the prior council was considering this legislation for the first time. And nowhere in that legislative history was it ever suggested that there should be zoning for C1 to allow for a medical dispensary to be placed. So I think that being consistent with what we've done in this county, it may make sense that we continue you know, in some of the courses of where we're allowing this, but I think C1 should be out. So for that reason, I would ask my colleagues to support this amendment. Um, we're gonna to go to the administration, then we'll go to Ms. Pickard and uh, Ms. Lacey. Thank you. Um, the administration opposes this amendment. Um, I think it's been stated before, even with um, uh, the bill as, as drafted, even before this amendment, uh, we would still be one of the most restrictive counties uh, in the state, if not the most restrictive. Um, I think there was a stat that stuck with me from the last hearing. Anne Arundel County has the fourth highest number of patients in the state. Um, I think folks need access and uh, I think uh, the bill as as amended as it sits now um, is a reasonable approach to that and appreciate the intent but uh, the administration opposes the amendment. Councilwoman Pickard. I'd just like to re review our C1 <clears throat> code um, and tell folks who maybe haven't, don't have the understanding of all of our zoning codes. So you can have an adult daycare center in C1, you can have a liquor store in C1, you can have a medical uh, facility in C1, you can have a, gasoline, a gas station in C1, you can have a bakery, you can have banks, you can have a barber shop, you can have a bicycle, motor scooter, moped sales and service without outside storage facility in C1. You can have a business complex. You can have a carnival, a circus, a fair uh, temporarily in C1. You can have a child care center, Christmas tree sales. Civ um, you can have telecommunications. You can have a pharmacy. You can have a conference center. You can have construction. You can have a convenience store. You're getting the understanding of what all can go in C1. You can have a dog care facility. You can have draw dog care. Cram this is all permitted use. We're talking about special exception where you have to ask permission after you've met all the conditions. You can have a grocery store up to 20, 25,000 square feet. You can have a hair salon. You can have a hardware store. You can have a health club. You can have home occupations, housing for elderly of moderate means. You can have a locksmith. You can have a mailing and shipping services. You can have a poultry, meat, or seafood market, medical or dental stores. I think that's enough of the list. So. We also have 228 CVSs in the state of Maryland. We have, I think Mr. Uh, Zablowski mentioned 56. I think we actually have 71 open medical cannabis dispensaries in the state currently with the 
opportunity to have 101. We have two in Anne Arundel County that are currently opening, open and operating for 9,000 patients. Um, while I appreciate the amendment and the thought behind it, um, to be quite honest, the bill as it's written when passed probably doesn't do exactly everything that we should have it be doing, but it is hopefully enough to get our 10 dispensaries open and operating and providing access to patients. Um, so I thank you for your time. I'm, I'm out. Councilwoman Lacey. Um, yes, Councilman Volke, I would just like to ask you if you could explain a little better why you feel that the special exception process itself is insufficient to protect the interests of persons whose dwellings are nearby within whatever distance we're speaking of. Sure. So I don't think that this should even be on the table. And well, I understand with, that, with, but I mean, well, it's right, on the table. So no, why is the special exception process? That's my point, is so okay. that the special exception process creates an opportunity that this could go in a C1 district. If we don't have it there, then regardless of whether or not the hearing officer agrees or not, it just simply isn't even an option. And I don't think it should even be an option on the menu for businesses to locate in C1 with a medical cannabis dispensary. So that's why. I don't... Well, then I think the special that's exception process is where I'm still confused because yeah. I see the special exception process as being a mechanism that is um, oriented toward balancing different interests of community members, which includes businesses and residents and people with needs for access to medical cannabis, um, and that in general that supports the idea that the community should have uh, both knowledge, right, notice, and an opportunity to give their input, and that we, since we don't sit as any kind of judicial or quasi-judicial body, we have to create processes that are sufficient to be fairly applied to achieve the objectives of our legislation. So, um, so to me, the reason of not liking or being comfortable with a medical cannabis dispensary being possibly located in C1, if it meets all the conditions, and receives a special exception isn't necessarily one of the reasons that I think should be cognizable at our level in our branch of government. Yeah, I, I, I recognize and understand that. Frankly, this is a similar argument to what I've had with the variance process where I've indicated that I'm not sure why it is that we need to cut back the limits in terms of the distance requirements and some of the other things that this bill does uh, with respect to the distance because, again, we don't sit as a quasi let, um, quasi judicial body, and therefore I've made the argument both to the administration and, and to Councilwoman Pickard that, in my opinion, that's what the variance process is going to do, and you're going to be able to weigh all of that together. And, and as I've been informed by the administration through planning and zoning, um, that's not really the appropriate place for that. So while I understand your argument, that's that's literally the same argument that I've been making about reinstating variances and why do we need to shorten up some of these distance requirements if we now have a variance procedure. And what I've been told is that's not really the purpose of a variance to do it that way. And so I think it's the, the same sort of argument that has been provide or the same justification that's been provided to me I think is the same justification that would apply in this situation well so if I may one final I guess piece of that is just perhaps for my own edification but perhaps also for yours um, <laughs> I don't know um, when are we allowed permitted or can we is it reasonable or maybe it's not even a good idea to consider whether we can make any of our conditions um, essentially unwaivable through a variance process on top of the special exception zoning. Because my, maybe I'm misunderstanding this, but I don't think you, you get the special exception unless you meet all the conditions. And if you then also are going for a variance, if, if I'm wondering whether are you perhaps saying there should be some restriction on what can or can't be waived in the variance process? I may be saying that. I think I have to ask the administration and, and planning and zoning the way. <laughs> um, 
Lori Rhodes, Assistant Planning and Zoning Officer. A variance would be some a variance to one of the criteria, and you can't separate it. You're either seeking okay. a variance in total or you're not seeking a variance at all. So either you're allowing the variance process to be in place or you're restricting it by not allowing a variance to the process. And what clouds the issue with the special exception is when you seek a variance to one of the criteria. Okay. Because that indicates that you can't meet the criteria and a variance should be based on whether or not there's something unique and inherent to the site, not whether or not it can fit into a specific congressional district. It sort of takes away the efficiency of, of that process. Okay. So is it, does, maybe another way of putting that is that the special exception zoning designation represents a predetermination as a policy matter by the legislative body that these zones would be appropriate so long as these conditions are met, as opposed to we didn't make any decision, we're going to just leave it to the property owners to come and ask for a variance, um, even, you know, or the Correct. business it's, owners. It's predetermined that it can uh, meet the special exception requirements. We did include some criteria when legislation was passed to the general requirements that looks at location, whether or not a specific location uh, would satisfy the general criteria. Thank you. Mr. Volke. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I, I had another question I wanted to ask um, the sponsor of the bill. Councilwoman Pickard, um, you had noted that you hoped that this legislation was enough to get the additional two to get us to the 10 open dispensaries. Do you have a sense of whether or not this legislation will in fact allow these final two dispensaries that we've been dealing with, whether this will allow them to open or not? <clears throat> I think it increases their uh, opportunity to locate, yes. Okay. Have you had any discussions with either of the two licensees for these dispensaries to find out if this bill would in fact create the conditions that allow them to open their dispensaries? I don't know, I thought they were Have you talked to either of the two licensees to find out if this is gonna solve their problem? Not the licensees directly, okay. but yes, I have talked to stakeholders mm -hmm. that represent uh, not just the, there's two licensees that I'm aware of, but there's also <clears throat> two currently open and 10 licensees. So there are two that are uh, in my area, in your area, um, and I believe this criteria, um, as long as everything else goes in their favor, uh, puts them in business? The last two. The last two. Okay, I just want to be clear. That's all I have. Okay, any further questions from the council? Okay, um, let's, Madam Secretary, could you please call the roll on amendment number five? Ms. Pickard. No. Mr. Volke. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. Ms. Rodvian. No. Ms. Hare. Aye. Ms. Lacey. Nay. Mr. Prusky. Nay. Three in the affirmative, four in the negative. Uh, amendment number five is defeated. Okay, uh, Bill 719 as amended will be heard at our next meeting, April 1st, uh, Monday, 2019. Moving along, uh, Bill number 919, Madam Secretary, please read the title of Bill number 919. Bill number 919, an ordinance concerning subdivision and development, critical area overlay, lot consolidation and reconfiguration. Okay, looks like we have a panel, Mr. Trumbauer and the crew. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's a pleasure to be for you tonight, Council. I'm Chris Trumbauer with the administration. I'm joined at the table. We have Kelly Krinitz from Office of Planning and Zoning. We have our planning director, Phil Hager, and of course, Greg Swain, county attorney. We discussed this bill at length during the work session, so I won't re rehash that conversation, but just in summary, um, this is corrective legislative action. Um, the Critical Area Commission currently has the county under a moratorium where we are prohibited from doing any approvals of anything involving lot con uh, reconfiguration. Um, the issue at question is using um, non-contiguous parcels uh, in the calculation of what is allowed or not allowed in critical area developments. This is a result of the Turtle Run uh, land use decision. So uh, we work collaboratively with the Critical Area Commission to put this bill forward. Um, very briefly, it just, um, 
puts into our code um, uh, language addressing lock configurations. Uh, that was a deficiency in our code that was not there until this point. Um, again, we did discuss this at the work session, so I'll leave it at that, but if there's any specific um, technical questions, I'm happy to answer or turn it over to one of our um, experts on the panel here. Uh, Councilwoman here. Sorry, and I think, Mr. Hager, this might be one for you, but so the way I read it, you can't move lots, you can't reconfigure lots uh, in, and you can't sort of... Uh, what happens if there's a lot that spans both a critical area and outside? Because it doesn't the, the bill doesn't seem to deal with that. And what happens in that instance? Well, you'd have to look at the development right. So if it if you couldn't transfer a development right that existed outside of the critical area into the critical area. But it wouldn't affect the development right that's outside it otherwise. Right. The okay. development that's outside stays outside. The development right that is inside the critical area could be moved around inside the critical area. Okay. Um, and then so, so you can still, as long as the lots are sort of contiguous, you can still reconfigure just you have to separate what's in the critical area and what's out, right? Correct. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, any further questions? Let's open up for a public hearing. I do not have anyone uh, signed up. Is there anyone like to come forward to speak on 919? Ms. Johnson's on her way. <coughs> Julia Johnson, P.O. Box 6634, Annapolis, Maryland. <coughs> Excuse me. Once again, I'm behind in my homework. Um, I'm really concerned that I missed this entire bill. I did not know that this was on the horizon, or certainly not to be debated tonight. But it concerns me that something that is this important in this county was not, you know, no one presented any, you know, wrote, wrote to the Capitol that I saw. Um, I, I talked to, um, uh, I, I, I've, anyway, the upshot is I really wish that this had been m more publicly uh, raised, more opportunity for discussion, um, because we have these communities like Harold Harbor that I'm particularly familiar with where the lots were 25 by 100. I own a pair of, of lots. Gee, that makes it 50 by 100. Uh, that makes it too small for modern development. What happens, though, through the community is the builders and developers come through, and magically properties that are on steep slopes that don't perk suddenly you know, are no longer on steep slopes while well, they're absolutely level. And they certainly do perk. And <clears throat> there's been a lot of consternation. There's been a lot of, of you know, distress. And yet <clears throat> the problems are not resolved. So in my personal opinion, this is a very important bill that deserved more public notice, more opportunity to get input from the many, many other similar communities with you know these small lots that were built you know, back in the 20s or the communities were laid out in the 20s when people were allowed to come in you brought in your, your tent you could bring in your tent but you had to have you know a, a septic system that worked or you could you know you could rent a cottage to, to be brought in by a truck and left and then you carried they, it was carried away at the end of the season please summarize Ms. Johnson so there are many communities that were not designed for year-round living that are now in existence, and those communities, I believe, deserve notice of what was going to happen here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Yes, ma'am. Uh, let, let's make this the last call before we close the public hearing. Anyone else like to speak on 919? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Susan Cochran. Uh, 332 Edgewater, uh, 332 Hamlet Circle, Edgewater, Maryland. I just want to say that this is an extremely important correction, and um, we all saw that at the Turtle Run long, long board hearing that went on the Board of Appeals. Unfortunately, uh, that seems to have been solved uh, for everyone's benefit. But um, I'm very happy that this was brought up, and I just want to say I hope you vote and approve it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Tate, did you have something or? Okay. Any other further questions? 
All right, the public hearing is now closed. Um, seeing there's no discussion, Madam Secretary, can you please read the title of Bill 919? Bill number 919, an ordinance concerning subdivision and development, critical area overlay, lot consolidation, and reconfiguration. Okay, Councilwoman Fiedler and then Councilman Volke. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I understand. Good. All right, please call the roll, Madam Secretary, on Bill number 919. Ms. Pickard? Aye. Mr. Volke? Aye. Ms. Fiedler? Aye. Ms. Rodvian? Aye. Ms. Hare? Aye. Ms. Lacey? Aye. Mr. Prusky? Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Bill number 919 is passed. Thank you. Bill 1019. Madam Secretary, please read the title of Bill 1019. Bill number 1019, an ordinance concerning Millburg Special Community Benefit District. Okay, uh, we'll start off with the administration. Mr. Barron and the crew. Evening. Uh, once again, for the record, uh, Pete Barron with the administration. Uh, with me at the table is Ms. Adebo and Ms. Bray. Um, how do I do? All right. Um, uh, just, uh, we discussed this uh, at the work session. Um, this is a creation of a special community benefit district. Uh, the county administration brings forward legislation to establish a special community benefit district only at the request of the community and only when uh, certain qualifications have been met. Uh, there's a petition process uh, and a 50% threshold uh, that must be met and valid. Uh, since the Special Community Benefit District is a community administration, the county administration does not take a position other, to ver other than to verify that the procedure to establish the SCBD was properly followed. Um, we've heard some concerns uh, with some folks uh, about this uh, creation, uh, but the folks here at the table with me can uh, talk more about the petitions and the number that were validated. As I mentioned, you know, uh, the administration does not have a position on this particular creation. The community met the qualifications and, and we are bringing it forward. Um, Millburr is in Councilmatic 3 um, and uh, the property owners within the boundaries have uh, and I think there are some signed up to testify, um, have met the qualifications to bring forward the uh, special community district, benefit district to the council. So with that, happy uh, to answer any questions. Okay, we do have folks sub public hearing, but Councilman Bulky. I just had a quick question for the budget office. Um, how many are we up to now in terms of the residents who have submitted app, um, responses to the petition favorably to say that they are in favor of this? Right now we're up to 51 residents. I, I apologize, Tommy Adebo, budget office. Um, right now we are up to 51. I did receive about five minutes ago four new petitions um, bringing us up to the um, 51 count. Okay, so yes. that's 51 out of 80? Out of 79. 79, okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay, any uh, questions? All right, let's go to public hearing. Uh, we'll now open the public hearing. Remarks will be limited to two minutes. We do have folks signed up uh, at the table here. We're going to call six at a time. Um, when you come forward again, your name and address. Uh, we'll start with the first six. Uh, Mr. Steve Johansson, uh, Ms. Angela Cremens, uh, Cher Ms. Cheryl Milo, Ms. Uh, Mr. Larry Turner, Mr. Steve Schwartz, Mr. Andrew uh, Mosier. Uh, if you would all come forward. And again, I apologize for the names. I'm reading it how it's listed here. I'm trying to do my best. But um, Mr. Johansson, when, once you get settled, you, you may begin with your name and address. Do I stand or? There's a seat right on the end. Over there? It's kind of like standing in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Steve Johansson. My family and I have lived in Millburgh since 1990. I most recently served as treasurer in the past six years. Milber on the Bay is a beautiful community. The hard work of community volunteers committed to the repair and restoration of its amenities provide landmark benefits to its residents, maintain and increase real estate values while protecting the estuary Cornfield Creek, the Magothy River, and ultimately the Bay. 
Our community, when initially established in the 1960s, provided for an A paying and a B non-paying membership. In the 1970s, this appeared to be a practical idea. B members are not entitled to use community amenities, such as the pool, boat docks, and volleyball courts, and the A members could invite guests to use the facilities on a limited basis. A good plan in concept, but as it turned out, non-voting B members developed friendly neighborhood relationships with A members, who in turn invited them as guests, their B members, to use community facilities. Ultimately, non-paying Class B members created deficiencies in our annual budget and uncollected fees over the years ran into thousands of dollars. At one point, we had 11 non-paying residents who opted to be Class B members. Collection of dues for Class A members slowed, and trying to get residents to pay in a reasonable amount of time was challenging. Good intentions do not pay the bills, and those residents with less than good intentions received economic benefits of the Millboro amenities without financially participating in maintaining them. Millburgh Communities Reserve was expensed over the last 10 years with improvements to the septic tank, clubhouse, pool, bulkhead, and boat docks. Approval of the Millburgh's SBCD will assure that residents living in Millburgh will, summarize, sir. will continue to invest in the communities which will help protect critical areas, the waterways, and the Chesapeake Bay. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you for your time. Uh, Angela, Ms. Cremins. Hi, um, my name's Angela Cremins, and I live at 23 Milburn Circle, a property that's not historically part of Milburn. Um, 30 years ago, however, I had purchased a house at 45 Milburn, which was part of the Milburn um, community, but I didn't know that. I bought it anyway, because I liked the house. Um, so the Milburn Club did not influence my decision at all. And when I lived there, I paid my dues, I used the pool, and I served on the board of directors. But since then, I've moved a couple of times, and now I, I live at 23. I'm opposed to the SCBD. Milburn annexed our home at 23 Milburn to the community without our consent, and now the community wants us to pay a mandatory tax to support their club. Under the SCBD, we would be taxed with no benefit to us unless we pay a large upfront additional sum, the amount of which has been dictated by the community. We will not be able to use the club amenities and will have no say in how our tax dollars are used unless we pay in excess of $17,000. Um, $17,000 is an exorbitant initiation fee. Not only that, but how can we tax for something that requires an initiation fee to use? No other benefit from taxes requires the payment of an initiation fee. In 2018, Milba charged $14 a foot for the boat slip fees, well below the current rate in the area of $80 a foot. We should not be compelled to subsidize boat ownership costs for others. An increase in property taxes by 20% is not something that should be taken lightly. This money is money that can benefit our county. I would rather see a 20% increase in taxes go to support our schools than a private club. Please vote against raising our property taxes by 20% for this frivolous use. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cheryl. Lila. Hello. Okay. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Cheryl Milo. I live at 21 Milburn Circle, Pasadena, Maryland. I've lived there for over 65 years. That lot known as the William L. Cook subdivision was never part of Milburn. That was all family owned. My grandfather brought that tract of land back in 1913. Milburn did not exist. Where Milburn is now was a farm. And my grandfather donated uh, for free 15 feet all the way down so that the man who developed Milburn could have the, the um, permission to use the road, to have a road built there. And if he were alive, to, if he knew what was ahead, he would never have given that. There would never have been a Millboro community without my grandfather donating all that land. Um, Millboro is a private club since from the beginning, 
they excluded 37 Milburn Circle, um, Vernon Richardson, from the very beginning and have never instated them to be included. So right then, that sets the presidents, that's an exclusion from their club for anybody to come in. And I didn't know there was a king in Milburgh that can say, okay, we're taking over the W.L. Cook track. So um, then uh, they tried to make us part of the community, which should be voluntarily not, not um, you know, forcing us, plus the taxes. I've lived there all my life, never used a pool, never used a clubhouse, never used a dock, which I would never use, not because the people aren't nice there. I just, no benefit, not interested. So, Please in, summarize. In conclusion, I want to say that if they forced us to join them, that would be taxation without representation because they would force us to pay back taxes, which Angela stated, to be able to vote on something I never used. Thank you, ma'am. And will never use. Thank you. Ms. Turner, or excuse me, Mr. Turner. Hi, my, my name is Larry Turner. I've lived at 23 Milburn since 1986. Uh, my home is one of the original homes in the five lots known as the W.L. Cook subdivision next door to Ms. Milo, which was created back in the 40s, long before Milburn was built. I have three key issues I just wanted to bring up. Uh, my home specifically should never have been included in the SCBD because it's never been part of the Milbert Club. In 2001, as evidenced in the bylaws, the club unilaterally amended their bylaws to include my property as an annex. But this was done without my knowledge or agreement, so I don't see how that can be valid, and it shouldn't be a basis for the SCBD. <clears throat> Another home on our street with the same situation, 37 Milbur, has been excluded from the SCBD boundary. And the club bylaws themselves provide an unequal way of administering the funds collected from the tax that favors certain members. As a gentleman on my right indicated, some members are not really members, as they cannot vote or otherwise participate in the club. And membership is not even guaranteed, even if you're in the SCBD. In 2011, I inquired about joining the club, and my request was denied. Under the bylaws, membership is at the discretion of the board, and this would still be the case in the SCBD. Some members would be taxed not only for a service they may not want, but access to the service could be denied by the club, even if they paid the fees. In our case, our property taxes go up, will go up by 20%, but we get no benefit and have no say in how the tax is spent. Unless we pay more than $17,000, and the board decides to offer us a Class A membership. In 2001, the fee was $5,000. So it's an arbitrary number. The second, the other point that I want to make is the W.L. Cook subdivision itself should not even be in the SCBD. Three of the five homes in the subdivision, a majority, do not want the SCBD and in fact voted against it. The SCBD process requires a simple majority of homes voting yes. But that same standard should be Please used summarize. to determine if the subdivision should be added included in the boundary. So I'm asking to vote against it. Alternatively, I ask the council to delay the vote and facilitate a process <coughs> for resolving this fairly. Things are not right with the way this is being pr proposed. During the entire process, no one has offered to discuss it with us so that it, it could be worked out in a mutually agreeable manner. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Schwartz. Hi, I'm Steve Schwartz. I live at 52 Milburn Circle. I am the president of the current president of the HOA, and I'm here to represent the community, the will of the community, uh, which in my opinion, the will of the community has 65% uh, of the people within the community out of the total of 79 homes uh, voting affirmative for it. Um, and the, uh, as was previously stated, but um, there are many amenities to the community. The community was set up in the 1960s, and there's a pool house and a pool, uh, along with a dock and a pier, as well as a boat ramp, and many other amenities. And those cost money to uh, maintain. Those cost money to operate. And from that, we believe a consistent flow of income is important. And to 
to do that, it is important for us as a community to be able to uh, le levy some type of a, a mandatory payment to support those facilities because if you decide you don't want to be part of the community, it doesn't take 1 80th of the pool away. We can't close 1 80th of the pool. So therefore, those are important things to keep in mind when we're talking about supporting the, those uh, those uh, capital items. Um, uh, to speak to some of the initiation fees, yes, there was an initiation fee. There still is an initiation fee. Um, in the early 1990s, there were some new home construction uh, that happened, and those people paid $9,000. Um, later in 2002, the four homes on the Cook Track were offered to buy in um, at $5,125. Um, two joined and two did not. And as part of that, and then in 2014, one par uh, an additional property that was subdivided from 23 Milber was also uh, joined the community through a payment of $17,000 approximately. And that fee was calculated based on and Please original, summarize. sure. Uh, that was calculated based on the original fee of $9,000 in 1990 and used as a consumer pricing index increase, a, a very flat index. And um, the last point I'd like to make is that our, because uh, the community, the benefits that the community provides, we received estimates that um, in 2010, the additional fee or the additional added value to the property was 30,000. And from a realtor we received in 2015, the additional fee or the additional value added to the property because of the amenities was 40 to $60,000. Thank, thank you, Mr. Schwartz. I gotta keep moving uh, on. Sorry. I was done there. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Mr. Bozier. Andy Bowser, my wife and I purchased 69 Milburn in 2005. The Milburn community has shown consistent and strong support for the Special Community Benefit District for the past four and a half years. The community voted to pursue the concept of the SCB to its annual meeting in fall of 2014. In the summer of 2015, a poll of the community was conducted with an 84% response rate. 79% of the respondents favored making pool and annual dues mandatory. Since resolving that threshold question, the community has conducted three separate votes concerning the SCBD. The first in July of 2016 was the vote on the original petition. The vote was 49 to 16 in favor, although the county disqualified nine ballots, decreasing the count to 42 in favor and 14 opposed, based pretty much on the fact that the names on the ballots didn't track exactly the names on the tax records. After further processing of the community's petition, the county determined that the modifications to the petition were necessary for several reasons, the most important of which was to clarify that only improved lots would be assessed under the SCBD. This clarification was an accommodation to Mr. Turner, who, in the, county view, in the county's view, owes, owns two lots, one improved, the other not. And so without the clarification, he would be assessed twice. In March of 2017, the community conducted a second vote adopting a revised petition to address these points. The, this vote was 53 in favor, 10 opposed, although the county at that time uh, again disqualified five ballots because of discrepancies in names. On March 11th of this year, the county notified Milburn that it was disqualifying an additional nine affirmative ballots for a total disqualification of 14. We have worked diligently to address the county's concerns with those ballots and have resubmitted 10 ballots which we believe are compliant, raising the count to 15, 51 affirmative votes or 65%. More than confirming the overwhelming support, in January of 2018, the community voted to amend its bylaws in order to be able to establish the SCBD. Please summarize. The community voted 47 to 5 in favor of the bylaw amendments, a 90% favorable vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before this group uh, dismissed, we have some questions. Councilman Bolke. I'll actually defer to Councilwoman Hare first because okay. I may be longer. Sure. sure. Thank you. Um, Mr. Schwartz, I believe it is, right? President? Okay. Uh, Mr. Turner said something that struck me. Is it accurate that the bylaws allow you to refuse someone who wants access to the club? The bylaws do. The bylaws do not uh, allow the community to vote and say you can't be part of the community. Um, there is a provision in the bylaws that say you have to pay the back fees or the back dues. That would be the only limiting factor. So as long as someone, if this were to pass, as long as someone pays the initiation fee, they cannot be uh, refused access to the club and the privileges and benefits that come with it. That's correct because the county, um, the county law office 
Kim Kinnerly, I believe her name is, um, in conjunction with the law office, said that that had to be taken out of our bylaws. So that was part of the vote that uh, Andy uh, mentioned um, in 2018. Okay, you anticipated my second piece of that. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> yeah. oh, Mr. Volke. Thank you. Yeah. So I just wanted to address a couple things. Um, Mr. Turner, you had noted that no one has discussed this with you, but I think you would note that you and I met about this, and I think you also met with Councilwoman Rodvian, and I don't know if you've met with anyone else, but so there have been individuals who have met with you. So I just wanted to correct that for the record. That was a statement. Um, and I guess the other piece of my question, this would be to Mr. Turner. So when you and I met, there was some correspondence that you showed me from different points over the past really 30 years where either you've requested to be in Milburn or Milburn's requested you to be in the district and then you've requested and then they've requested. So there have been a lot of back and forth sort of discussions about whether or not your property is going to be in the community. Is that a fair characterization? They can turn that on for you. There's been discussions. Okay. And there's not been a resolution, but there have been discussions. There's never been a forced, um, I've never been told I have to be in right. and pay the tax. Okay. okay, any other questions for this group? All right, you're dismissed. We do have some other uh, folks that have signed up. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Matt Turner, Mr. Joseph Bull. Mr. David Perone, Mr. Bill uh, Karzak, I believe. If you all would come forward. And again, we'll go in that order. Once Mr. Turner is ready, just state your name and address in two minutes. Hi, my name is uh, Matt Turner, 59 Milburn Circle. Um, <clears throat> I'm here to uh, talk about the SVD um, and the uh, reason why I am speaking today is because I have uh, knowledge of most of the expenses over the last four years as pool director. I currently hold pool director. Um, so this, this will provide future stability for us. I want to share with you guys uh, some expenses um, over the last couple of years. Uh, annual expenses uh, last year, fiscal year 18, were 39,000, which that includes pool operation, labor, which includes lifeguards, which are mandatory, uh, grounds, architecture, and peer uh, re rehabilitation and insurance. Uh, other expenses are capital expenditures, uh, which in the last fiscal year 18 and 17, we have spent $52,000 on maintaining the properties that uh, were, were going downhill fast. So we have uh, put some uh, money into those to uh, protect our community um, for the long future. Um, our membership dues fiscal year 18 were 49K collected. So with our annual expenses versus our membership due, that's a delta of like 10K. So um, we have very, very little surplus to work with year to year on protecting our amenities that would be the pier, the pool, um, and volleyball court and common area space. Um, so if, providing that the SCBD goes through, the proposed fees would be converting, converted to approximately $667 a year. Um, and then uh, in final, I want to touch on some of the um, known future expenditures. Please summarize. Yes. Um, so. I'm looking for support in the bill due to the fact that we have a future to provide a backbone to um, for years to come. And I want to note that we have 94 kids to in the community, and we have 10 different generations, uh, multiple generations. That's where the parents and then the kids move back into the community. So this tells you how strong the community is. Thank you. Mr. Bull?
Thank you. My name is Joseph Bull. I live in 20 Milburn Circle, and I've lived there for the last 10 years. As the VP uh, when starting our SCBD, I was the primary person communicating with the county. I sent my first email to Billy Penley in August 2015. Our early draft of the petition included addresses and associated tax IDs and did not include 23 Milburn. Billy asked if 23 Milburn could become part of the SCBD, and I said yes if they had paid the initiation fee. In October, Billy said the Office of Law wants a petition to be used as plats. I asked to keep the tax ID to exclude 23 Milburn. In November, Billy stated 23 Milburn must be included. It cannot be excluded because the owner never joined the association. Milburn would still have the right to require everyone to adhere to the rules, including the fee. In January 2016, I had a call with Tomi, the new SCBD coordinator. She reiterated 23 Milburn needed to be included in SCBD. Later in January, I talked with Nancy Shrum, Director of Constituency Services. She responded in March, stating the Office of Law again confirmed 23 Milburn had to be included. The district must include the platted community. In March 2016, Milburn moved forward with including 23 Milburn. After receiving the approved petition, we began the signature process and informed 23 Milburn. In 20, January 2017, petition announcement was made and a hearing was scheduled. It was then pulled by the county because of two non-buildable lots, which would have charged 23 Milburn twice based upon the structure of the SCBD. Milburn redid the petition again to reference only the improved lots, not charging 23 Milburn twice. In October 2017, the county asked us to modify our bylaws, which was referenced earlier, which we completed. We've complied with every expectation set forth by the county and the law department in this SCBD process. Finally, 23 Milburn has been provided several opportunities to pay the initiation fee, including 2002, our initial pursuit of the SCBD in 2016, and a reminder today that the offer is always available. We were consistent, follow the county's direction, and were fair in our approach. Thank you, sir. Mr. Perone. Hi, my name is Dave Brown. I live at uh, 14 Milburn Circle. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, thank you for the chance to speak. My wife, Denise, and I have lived in Milburn for almost 28 years. In 1991, when we purchased our home, 9,000 went to the Milburn community for our initiation to the Milburn Community Association, as did the five other houses in our group. These fees and dues help maintain and improve our community amenities. The decision to spend 9,000 was one of the best decisions I've ever made, other than one to, to marry my wife. In the early years <clears throat> in Milburn, we all chipped in to do a lot of maintenance and projects ourselves on the weekends or after work. Work parties were formed and we, we tackled items like playground equipment, bulkhead repair, pool plumbing, etc. And to be truthful, many of these repairs were really jury rigs. Now it's time to pay the piper. Over 30 years of the do-it-yourself repairs have raised their ugly heads. Lifestyles have changed over the years. Now many families must have two income earners and are not available for the work parties. And many of the old timers have turned gray and lost some strength and hair. It is time, um, it is time to get the projects completed professionally by certified contractors. But as we all know, that means real dollars and a lot of them. This is why the majority of the community members feel special community benefit district would help secure our future, knowing we have a better estimate of our annual income. We have prospered here in Anne Arundel County and in Milburn. My wife and I are very excited with all the young new community members, and we want the same great neighborhood and community experience we had for them. The majority of the Milburn members would appreciate your support for Bill 1019. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm Mr. Karzak. Hello, my name is Bill Krozak. I live at 991, excuse me, 91 Milburn Circle. Uh, I moved to uh, Milburn in 1998, so we've been there a little, a little over 20 years. I've raised a son there. Uh, it's a wonderful neighborhood to raise children. Uh, every, every child had more than one mom. Uh, I would ask the council to support this tonight. Uh, as treasurer, I went door to door collecting the dues from, uh, from folks that had not gotten it to us in time to pay the bills. Uh, the neighborhood strongly needs this. Uh, we, we need to continue our, our 
our development of, of the neighborhood, of the main, maintenance of the neighborhood, uh, to maintain high uh, home prices and good tax uh, support to the county. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any, uh, we do have Ms. Pickard, question for this group. I have a question. Um, so earlier someone stated that the annual expenses were 39,000. Correct. And y'all have about 78, 79 members. 77 homes. So that's like $500 a year. That's it. So is the issue that you're not able to collect the 500, I mean, do you have dues? Yes. You have annual dues. Annual dues. <laughs> so you have, and, and so your members are paying their dues, but you also need to go in above your annual dues to make this. Are you going to have Correct. both? You're going to have a. No. Right. So, so right now we have a pool due and dues, and then we have annual dues. You can elect not to pay for one or the other. With the SCBD, it would uh, roll those in together, which, which then would be right. What I said, wait, six sixty-seven. Per okay. household. So it's not over and above no. the dues. No. I see. Thank you. Sir, can you put your name on the record again? You were, you were the pool manager, correct? Am That's I? correct. Okay. Matt Turner. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for this group? All right. You're all dismissed. Thank you. Um, seeing no more movement in the audience, uh, the public hearing uh, on Bill 1019 is closed. Chairman. Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Robian. I actually had a couple questions for the um, Office of Law. Oh, sure. We're going to bring too. that back up. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you do have one. I'm sorry. We have one more person. All right. Last call. Anybody else for 1019? This is it. All right. Thank you. Name and address. Uh, two minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joshua Rosakowski. I live at 10 Milburn Circle. Um, I am here uh, as the vice president of the community. And I'm really here just to back up and support the other members that have spoken to you already and hit on a few points um, that they also have hit on. As you can see, we've got probably 15 or 16 um, members from the community here in support of the bill, uh, all people that would like to see this go through. Um, I'd also like to say that I feel like I'm standing in a little bit for the rest of the community that couldn't make it in, whether it was because of family or something else like that, um, that want to support the bill. So for me, um, let me just hit on a few points from some of the other folks that have spoken uh, previous to me. Uh, 37 Milburn wasn't included in community because it was in a different plat uh, that the county didn't require included. Um, and then to correct another statement from earlier about 23, which we've tackled quite a bit. Um, 23 wouldn't owe back taxes, uh, only future dues. So with that being said, um, there's a lot of great facilities for everybody in a family at Milber, um, whether it's the pool, the park, uh, the boat ramp, uh, water access, it's a great school district, obviously it's a sought after community. There's a lot of value in living there. Now I'm new to the community, I've only been there about three and a half years with my family. I have a seven to 13 year old daughter. Um, but in my honest opinion, I don't look at it as a private club. I don't think that SCBD would make it a private club. Um, in my experience, everyone's been friendly, open and honest with each other and there's nobody in the community that I've dealt with that hasn't been willing to um, make things work, discuss issues or concerns, and try to come to an impartial Please agreement. summarize. Um, I think we said that at this point we have 51 yes, yes ballots. Um, we're over the threshold that's required by law. Um, I would just say that uh, the S SCBD would create some security and some um, Sorry, I'm fumbling a little bit. Uh, it would give us some security and some confidence in knowing that for someone like myself and my family just moved in, there's a future. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. All right. The, the public hearing is now closed on 1019. Um, we're going to have Madam Secretary please read the bill, to, uh, 1019, and then we'll open it up for some discussion. Thank you. 
Bill number 1019, an ordinance concerning Millburg Special Community Benefit District. Councilwoman Rabian. So um, my question for the law Office of Law is, um, one of the things that I heard that really troubled me was that there were homes that were added to the HOA, that were added to the community without their consent or their notice. Is this a typical procedure? Under what circumstances does this happen? Uh, thank you, Council Member. I cannot answer that question specifically because when the uh, community petitions for or begins a petition process for an SCBD, they come to us with their existing bylaws, which typically define the boundaries of the community. And in this case, since I believe 2015, when this was first submitted, it the boundaries have remained the same. There have not been any changes into the boundaries. What the law office and the office of budget um, starts with is that boundary that's been defined by the community itself. And in some cases, depending on um, whether there are homes that are clearly left out or, home, or, or um, parts of the plats that have not been referenced, for example, a phase of a subdivision where you know a plat has been left out, we check that to make sure that there is some contiguity and cohesion of uh, communities defined by their own bylaws. Um, but we can't speak to the history of how that assemblage was made. So I'm unaware of this allegation of annexation or how that took place. But um, in reviewing the plats that have been identified and the um, aerial photographs and sort of the subdivision history in that area, it appears to the, the law office that this meets the requirements of a single community that would benefit from the improvements that are being proposed to be maintained by the SCBD dollars assessed. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another question as well. Is it typical, and again, I don't know if this is something, you know, this is a little bit out of the um, scope of this particular situation, but is it typical that SCBDs collect both dues and SCBD payments? Is some, that? Some do. I think Ms. Adebo can probably um, give some examples, but the, there are two different issues in our view. Legally, the SCBD is um, administered by the same community organization that could also collect dues um, and maintain those in a separate account, but the SCBD um, dollars can't be commingled with those and could only be spent on purposes that are related to the SCBD as um, found in the code. Yeah. Okay. All right. I see Ms. Councilwoman Hare, did you have a question for Mr. Volke? Okay. <laughs> Councilman Volke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this is for Office of Law. I, I continue to be a bit baffled why we cannot simply identify by tax ID number which parcels are going to be in and which are out, particularly because this 37 Milburn circle causes me a lot of distress. This idea that because they were never platted and therefore the platted you know, lot was never added to the bylaws of the HOA, that somehow they don't have to be included, which is my understanding of what's happened. So I, I guess what my question really is, is, is it a, we cannot do it this way because it's a, a not legal way to do it to identify them by tax ID, or is it that it's less convenient or that it's you know more unwieldy? Wh wh which is it? I guess that's what I'm trying to understand. That's a good question. The, um, the answer is there's nothing that legally prevents us from doing a, an, a ledger of tax accounts. In fact, you'll find in mm -hmm. the code there are communities that are identified that way. Um, it has been the county's practice for at least the last three years, and actually I think going back several years um, before that, to identify by plat rather than by tax account for a couple of reasons. One, it's unwieldy to codify. Um, two, it is um, 
it it ins when we are presented with plats, it makes the verification process that I was describing for Councilmember Rodvian a lot easier for the Office of Law and the Office of Budget. When we're given just a list of tax accounts, that actually requires a county staff member to go line by line to make sure that we've caught them all. When we as and as opposed to leaving that for the Office of Finance to make sure that there's a check and balance on this contiguous community that's been identified and reviewed by our offices. So the answer is it, it's not a matter of convenience so much as it's been a matter of policy for the Office of Law to start by identifying plats. If there's a compelling reason why the plats cannot do not identify the contiguous community, then we will consider other measures, including the listing by tax account yeah, number. I, I, and I to answer that. your question about, yeah. about 37 Milber, yeah. it's not just an issue of it not being previous, of, of it not being identified. It's, it's both issues. It is that it was not identified by the community, and we start there, mm -hmm. um, and, and also that we did not require it to be included because it hasn't been previously platted. If it had been platted as either part of Milbur, a reference to Milbur, part of the WL Cook tract, we certainly would have required it to be included. But because this is acreage that has never been subdivided, to at least to our knowledge, that's that's why we haven't mandated that it be included. Okay. So, and, and I guess this is what I just really want to make sure I'm clear on. There's nothing legally in the code that would say this body, if we found the circumstances warranted it, could not go through and amend this bill to say we are simply going to identify by tax ID number the parcels that will be included and not included in the SCBD. There's nothing that prevents us as the lawmaking body from doing that. It sounds like it may be a little bit more work that has to be done in terms of what Office of Law and Finance and maybe even Madam Auditor have to do. But if we found that this was the right situation that was the place to do it, we can do that. I don't think there would be anything preventing this body from doing that. It is a little unwieldy because the petition process, which is which is listed in the um, code, does not make reference to specifically to the council being making amendments like that. Typically, we are held to what the petition approved by the community says, mm -hmm. and in this case, the the petition that was approved by the community makes reference to those plats. However, there is nothing that I'm aware of that would prevent you from converting that so long as all of the county offices were clear that those are the tax accounts that fall under that same description sure. that was adopted by the community, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes absolute sense. I get it. So, and, and I know that you have done a lot of work on this particular special community benefit district. I've gone back through. We talked about this at the work session. I guess my question would be, I know that this is not the typical way that the county does it. This is not the policy that we followed. But I mean, it really seems to me like this is the odd sort of situation that might cry out for a little more attention than the community that was all built at one time and now has people coming in saying, hey, we want to be a special community benefit district. I mean, am, am I missing it? Or is this unusual? Is this type of situation what we're dealing with? Is this? typical of what we see with SCBDs? This is very typical of really? what we see of SCBDs. Okay. And I would say that outside of um, perhaps plats that are referenced in community bylaws but that can't be identified in the recorded plats okay. because they're improperly listed or in, um, not fully listed, we, we would always defer to the plats mm -hmm. in our description. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Councilwoman Robbie, or excuse me, Councilwoman Hare. And I, I just want to be sure they, these sort of annexed um, parcels, they have been this way since 2001, I think I heard. Is that fair? Again, I can't, I have to defer to the community on that. I know that the petition was first presented to our office in, I believe, 2000, late 2015 or early 2016, and it has always included the W.L. Cook tract as uh, the third plat, second or third plat. So it's the Milbur, the Milbur edition, and the WL Cook tract. Okay. Mr. Chair. Yes. May I answer, Councilwoman Hare? Uh, I have a copy of the Milbur bylaws, which shows the revision history, and it indicates that it was voted on and approved by the Milbur community on October the 11th, 2001. That was when the membership was um, expanded to include 
the four lots in the subdivision, which at that time I believe was the W.L. Cook subdivision. There were only four lots at that time. Subsequently, one of the lots was subdivided to make it five lots in that subdivision. And then there was another five lot subdivision added in 2014. I, I may be backward. It may be the W.L. Cook was 2014. But the two additions, there was one that took place in 20, 2011 and there was another one that took place in 2014. Okay, and 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 the it's five lots in the W L Cook subdivision. That's correct. And of those five lots, to I mean, I, I'm just wondering if we're talking about tax IDs and all this other stuff. Of those five lots, how many of those homes uh, are currently members or want to be part of the SCBD? Do we know that? I believe only one of wants to be or yes. Only one voted yes. I, three. Okay, yeah, three. Actually, three actually three. think uh, that it's Guys, three. we can't okay. have people talk from the crowd. I apologize. Sorry. No Thank worries. you. Three. I, I have to follow up with you. I believe from my notes of the work session, it was three. Three of the five. And two okay. at, were opposed. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Pickard. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, I just want to, we have a green sheet here uh, noting the fiscal impact and the cost that the county will incur in administering the Millburg Special Community Benefit District are offset by the administrative fee charged when taxes are collected. So if there was to be due to go to buy tax ID, we do collect a fee so for the taxes being collected. So it wouldn't be... We are charging them, right, for the service of doing this? Mm -hmm. Yes, we do charge a fee, but we're saying that the cost to the county would be absorbed in that fee. Right, exactly. I'm, okay. Uh, I was getting to the, but uh, when I um, questioned the folks coming to the table earlier, the, the residents, um, they said that the annual dues the whatever, how many tiers of dues that they have are going to roll up into the SCBD. But you just said that a special community benefit district, the, those monies can only be used for certain things. So what what's what's the accurate? That's correct. The, the special community benefit district um, assessment uh, is made specifically for the purpose of improvement, as it's listed in the bill, as uh, for purpose of acquiring, maintaining, um, uh, and improving all community real and personal property, and then to defray the administrative costs necessary to accomplish those purposes, including repayment of loans, interest thereon, and insurance costs. So in this case, they could spend the SCBD um, funds on acquisition, maintenance, and improvement of any community-owned real or personal property, which would include the types of things that I believe it was Mr. Turner mentioned um, in terms of capital improvements, maintenance of the pool, those types of expenses. Um, the fiscal so note what can't it be spent on? <laughs> like what would they need? They, so would they still need the sort of homeowner's dues to do other things? Um, yes, that's correct. So okay. a lot of our districts currently, if, if they need to pay for expenses that are outside of the purposes listed in the petition, then they do collect dues in their, under the homeowners association. Okay. So it's not unusual to pay the SCBD tax and an additional voluntary fee. Okay. Um, okay. This is... As an, as an example, it might, this might answer your question. As an example, there are some community associations who, that um, hold social events, for example, or participate in benevolent uh, activities, philanthropy, things like that. Those types of expenses would not be permitted um, from SCBD dollars. But they can pay their lifeguards? They can pay their lifeguards because it's uh, operation, maintenance, improvement of okay. real property. Okay, okay. Thank you. Councilman uh, Volke and then 
Council Thank Council you, Mr. Roger. Chair. I just wanted to add to what I had mentioned to Councilwoman Hare earlier and for the benefit of the whole body. So it looks like it was October of 1988 that the Milbert II six-lot subdivision was added to the membership. It looks like it was 2001 that the W.L. Cook subdivision was added to the Milbert community. And then it was 2014 after that subdivision had taken place of Mr. Turner's lot in the Milbert, uh, well, I take that back, in the W.L. Cook subdivision. That was when it was amended to re that there were five lots there. So the first time that the W.L. Cook subdivision was added was actually October of 2001. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that, that I looked through the plat records I have. Okay, it's another question for Office of Law. Do you have other situations? I, I think that my biggest concern here is that we would have someone who would be subject to the SCBD but would not be able to um, participate or not be able to benefit from the amenities. And I'm just curious, is that something you've seen in other situations? Are there other situations where someone pays the SCBD but can, does not just does not, you know, chooses not to but is not allowed to partake of the um, community amenities? Because that, that just seems like fundamentally unfair um. the Williams case allows the um, allows the imposition of SCBD funds uh, where there is also a separate fee for f a facilities fee um, and the the prime example I have of that is Hillsmere which is which has a pool membership of an association membership um, which is separate and apart from the SCBD so um, for example there are those in Hillsmere who have the ability to join and be a member of the pool and I believe that gives them access to the beach as well um, whereas their SCBD taxes are being used for things like maintaining uh, other areas of, of community property in the neighborhood um, as well as the beach. So it's not that they, um, in this case, that there would not be any access. It's, I believe it's the, it's the facility fee that the, um, those in opposition are concerned about and would not be able to take part in those facilities. But this petition creates an SCBD where residents would be, uh, creates a pool of funds that could be used for, you know, the pool and the pier That's and all that, that could not be, I mean, that sounds different from the Hillsmere situation where, you know, um, you choose to, you know, join the pool and use the beach privilege um, in addition to your SCBD, which covers probably like plowing and or right. snow plowing and, you know, maintenance of common areas and things like that. Whereas this is those this is both though this is the maintenance of all community real and um, personal property so the uh, things like snow plowing maintenance of trails maintenance of any private you know lighting that's not maintained by the county those types of things could be spent by this community association to maintain uh, amenities in the Millburg community that don't necessarily require access. But they also can be spent for the things, for those other amenities, whereas in, that's it sounds correct. like in Hillsmere, that's a... SCBD funds are permitted to be used by the pool and in Hillsmere as well. But there is also a separate access fee for the that amenity in the community. And just by comparison, do you know if there's an initiation fee? I don't. Okay. All right. I think that $17,000 is pretty killer to me. Councilman uh, Vokey. Does anyone know if the community is currently using any of the dues that they get for anything other than the pool or the community areas, such as plowing of roads, lights, trail maintenance, anything like that? Do, do any of you know? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Seeing... Uh, oh. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I would ask that the council hold this bill for the possible amendment um, with respect to the discussion that we've had about the tax parcels. So I would ask um, respectfully that we do that. Okay. Is there a particular date you want to move, hold it till? Because we usually do that for holding it. Yeah, bill. I'd say till the next meeting. Okay. So we have a motion on the floor to hold this bill. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on that? I would also Sorry. just like to suggest to the community leaders um, to reach out to the parties in those parcels and see if there's some sort of agreement that can be reached. Um, because 
you, you may be uh, laughing. I, I'm not sure if this has been done before, but I, I think when you're talking about $39,000 of annual expenses and you're asking a member to pay upwards of $17,000 um, initiation fee, that's 40% paid by a single member. And I realize that other folks have you know, paid their initiation fees over time, but those, I imagine, would be typically rolled into your mortgage and not paid in cash all at once, where uh, you know, I think some of the folks that are resist most resistant did not have the opportunity to do that because of the timing of when they purchased their property. So I just, I would suggest that in the meantime, you look to see if there's some sort of resolution to uh, you know, help, uh, help find some sort of compromise because it sounds like you need the funds, but it also sounds like, in, in my mind, I can't vote for this SCBD as it is because there's a fundamental unfairness um, of the way some of these folks are being brought in. Um, before we have a, a motion on the floor for um, first and second, but before we do that, um, this is uh, my seniority coming out a little bit. Um, we're going to be voting on a lot of these. I'd ask the Office of Law and Administration, could you please give the legal litmus test to the council members about how you choose? I know you kind of gave a summary today, but you know the process. You know the, the lot comes in, or you know you check the plat, whatever. I think that'd be beneficial, and also how the auditors involved. I think just for the education of folks to see, because again, we're going to get a lot of these, and you're going to have people that are going to be opposed to it for it. And again, it could it could go on. And I understand the debate today. I'm to support the motion, but I think for the benefit of everyone, if, if you would be amen, amenable to that, that'd be of great. Of course, we'd be Absolutely. happy to provide that, okay. Mr. Chairman. Um, Madam Secretary, can we call the motion on uh, to hold um, Bill 1019 till the next meeting? Ms. Pickard? Aye. Mr. Volke? Aye. Ms. Fiedler? Aye. Ms. Rodvian? Aye. Ms. Hare? Aye. Ms. Lacey? Aye. Mr. Prusky? Aye. Seven the affirmative, none in the negative. The motion to hold the vote on bill number 1019 to April 1 is adopted. Great. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, Madam Secretary, please read the title of resolution number 1019. Resolution number 1019, resolution encouraging participation by Anne Arundel County residents in the United States Census Bureau's 2020 Census. Okay, uh, Mr. Barron. Good evening, uh, Pete Barron with the County Executive. Uh, resolution 1019 encourages Anne Arundel County residents to participate in the 2020 Census. Uh, as you all know, the Constitution requires a census be conducted every 10 years. Uh, we are coming up on the 2020 Census. Um, as we discussed in the work session, uh, the administration asked the council support these efforts as Anne Arundel County only had approximately 80% participation in the 2010 Census, therefore resulting in an undercounting of the population in both the county and the state. Um, um, funding of more than 50 federal programs is determined by census population, uh, including um, programs like Medicaid, highway funding, uh, the, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, the Children's Health Insurance Program, uh, Title I Education Grants, and uh, the WIC program. Um, this undercount uh, results in fewer dollars that goes to the state. Um, over the 10 year period. Uh, there was a study and it's estimated, I believe we gave the study to the auditor, um, an estimated $1,821 per year per person not counted, which over stretched over 10 years works out to be just shy of $20,000 uh, that the state does not see due to an undercounted individual. Um, the uh, administration is putting together a committee to encourage participation. Um, if the counties, uh, the county d is applying for a grant, uh, a grant uh, through the state, and I, at the work session I did misstate. There is a, I want to correct that, I, I believe I, I, I mentioned it both to Madam Auditor and Councilman Volke, uh, but I do want to uh, make it clear that there is a county match requirement of about $20,000, I believe, if we are awarded the full grant. Um, the the 
clarify though, this resolution is not asking for the council to support the grant application, only to encourage participants in the uh, 2020 census. Uh, these uh, census activities uh, will begin on April 1st. Um, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, it looks like we have a few. Councilwoman Fiedler and then Councilman Volke. Uh, yes, in the fiscal note, I have two questions. What is innovative outreach efforts and who are the folks least likely to respond? Um, so uh, let's take the first question. Um, they call them the hard to count populations. Uh, so it's usually folks from lower income uh, spectrums, uh, minority populations, and often rural areas. Um, so uh, that's ironically the folks whom the programs where federal funding is dependent on are often most helped uh, by uh, 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 being fully counted. Um, and, and as for innovative um, methods, I, I'm not quite sure uh, if I can define them, but uh, it's envisioned that there would be uh, PR campaigns around this. We would set up, um, if the, the um, grant is, uh, you'd be able to have some resources to uh, do some outreach things like even setting up a kiosk at a library could be something that you would do to answer questions. Um, to be clear, the actual counting will be done by uh, census officials. Okay. So this would just be encouraging uh, members of the community, mm -hmm. Anne Arundel County residents, to uh, stand up and be counted. And this is the first time a resolution like this has been done for a census, is that correct? I am not sure about that. I, I know uh, activities have been done every 10 years. I think uh, this administration thinks it's extremely important that everyone is counted um, for some of the reasons I, I articulated earlier. Okay, thank you. Councilman Volke. Thank you, Mr. Barron. I agree with you. It is important that everybody be counted. Um, I guess my question would be, it looks like this is going to cost the county about $45,000 if we get the match or the grant, because it would be $25,000 in money plus a $20,000 in kind, which is a cost of county services basically for a county employee to perform this function. Am I understanding that correctly? That is how we described it in the grant okay. application. Right. Um, so I guess, you know, you, you and I talked about this a little bit at the work session, but my question is, um, I heard you say that this is an assist only to the federal government, but I'm, I'm struggling just to take it back. The federal constitution says that the census is, prime, is a federal responsibility. We had this whole discussion a few months ago about immigration, and there was a discussion as to whether that was a federal or a county responsibility, and ultimately a majority of this body said, we think that this is not something the county should be involved with, this is a federal function. And what's interesting to me is Article 1, Section 2 talks about how the census is a federal function. Article 1, Section 8 basically says in the Constitution that naturalization is something Congress has control over, but historically actually states and localities have been involved in immigration. So I guess my question would really be this. How is this different in the sense of you know, assisting the federal government with a role that is primarily a supposed federal role, how does this differ in the administration's support today, whereas the administration was not supportive of participating in the 287G program, particularly when the 287G program costs were offset by the housing money that we were receiving, whereas here, this is straight out of the county's budget that we're going to be paying this. So I'm curious about that. Um, well, first... And you knew I was going to ask that. I so. did, I did. Um, uh, first, uh, if you do recall from uh, the discussion a, a few months back, the county does participate in the criminal alien program. Correct. Um, second, I think the, the cost offset that we talk about, um, that I referenced in terms of federal funding that is determined on these programs make this well worth it. And third, the county will not be participating in any uh, counting. Which is the which is the actual census taking? This is simply um, ensuring that people know because I, I, you and I both know that every ten years a census rolls around and it affects redistricting and it affects uh, uh, federal sure, funding. Sure. But many other many of our, our residents 
don't know and, and a little reminder that, hey, the census is coming around. When you get that form, uh, fill it out or somebody knocks on your door, um, it, take five minutes and, and answer the questions. But with the 287G program, the, the one thing that was interesting is the county wasn't issuing detainers at that point, similar to this. So the county was sort of doing some front end leg work and then the federal government was performing their function. That's basically the same thing here where the county's doing some leg work and then the counting, similar to issuing detainers, will be done by the appropriate federal agency. So I guess, I, again, I'm still confused as to the, the distinction. I think you and I are just going to have to agree to disagree that these <laughs> are in any way related. Okay. Or analogous is probably the word I should use. Thank you. Councilwoman here. When will you find out on the grant application? Um, it, that's up to the state. Um, so the grant application was submitted a few weeks back. I mean, hopefully soon. But I would be surprised if we hear before April 1st. We're gonna proceed with um, some activities uh, around it and, and um, announcements, but we'll, we will find out when the um, grant comes in and that's on the state timeline. And I'm, a, I'm sorry, I don't, wait, hold on, I might. Um, I don't know when the grant application, or when the grant decisions are done, I'm sorry, it's not. Um, Even though I do have something that says timeline in my packet, it does not. But regardless of how this comes out tonight, you said you're starting these activities and these initiatives on April 1st? Yeah, there'll be some announcements, um, but the, the only way that we'll be able to actually expend some funds is if we get the county um, or the state grant and the counties then match. I guess that's what I'm concerned about is that the, I agree everybody should respond to the census, but you're going to do these activities whether we vote in this resolution or not, and I'm concerned with the fact that we haven't seen a budget yet for next year, and this while it doesn't necessarily approve the expenditure, it implies approval of the expenditure, and you're asking the county council to essentially imply approval for this potentially $45,000 match before we've seen a budget. Um, I would, I just, that concerns me. The, uh, I, I hear that the, the resolution doesn't, is not dependent on the grant. Um, the grant is, um, you know, something that we think would have real value to the county uh, and the state. The, the going back to the, you know, it's twenty thousand dollars, almost eighteen thousand two hundred ten dollars over ten year period for every individual that's undercounted. Um, I think this is just a smart investment. Um, and, and in terms of the budget, uh, we will be bringing one forward soon, as everybody is well right. aware. <laughs> um, so. Councilwoman Feeler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I understand that the county will not be doing the counting, but as far as printing, translating, and distribu distributing advertising materials, will county employees be taking part in those aspects? Um, if we get the grant, there is some um, uh, some desire to do some of that, yes. But in terms of um, doing the census work, no. I mean, this would be, you could have these materials at, in public spaces on county property. Um, I don't believe we anticipate uh, sending uh, county employees out on the street corner and hopping up on a soapbox and telling people to uh, stand up and be counted. I guess my only concern is, you know, people who have not um, participated previously, I don't necessarily think that pamphlets in the library are going to motivate them to participate in this one. Um, I do think everyone should be counted, don't get me wrong. Um, I just don't know if, if this is the best way to go about it. I mean, uh, I'm sure our, our folks would be happy for suggestions. I think the going back to just the, just getting a couple of people could make a huge difference in terms of this study that shows that it's $18,000, $18,210 per undercount. So if we can get, you know, that up to 81% of Anne Arundel County residents participating, that will have some impact. Thank you. Councilwoman Pickard. 
I just couldn't resist. <laughs> um, really? Um, I, everyone can vote with their vote on this resolution, but a few Facebook posts and using the Anne Arundel County Facebook page and Twitter to talk about the census or the TV stations or this conversation right here, let's go for it. I support this resolution. Um, I, think, I think the benefits outweigh any sort of... Um, concern that might be. Councilman Volke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm hopeful that we can get some free advertising because Mr. Cook from the Capitol is here and maybe he can write about that so that hopefully we can get people to, as Mr. Barron said, stand up and be counted, which is frankly what we need. Councilwoman Lacey. <laughs> I share Councilwoman Hare's concern that to the extent the resolution may in any degree imply that we have pre-approved an expenditure that hasn't been presented to us. I don't agree with that part. But I completely agree with Councilwoman Pickard that, um, that this is something that is uh, the benefit certainly outweighs um, <laughs> the amount of time that we've spent talking about this. So I will be, I will be voting when it is uh, appropriate to support the resolution. Thank you, and the best for last, the chairman has a question. Um, this is a, um, I, I don't be clear on this, this is a federal government grant, but you also mentioned the state. So, no, it's, so, a, it's so a state let's, grant. Let's be clear. State. Okay, so this is a state grant, so we're not even talking about a federal grant. This is a state grant. Um, is this being offered to all the uh, jurisdictions in Anna Arundel? As far as I'm aware, every county in Maryland is uh, open to apply. I don't know which ones have chosen to apply. Okay, and just offhand, you mentioned the impact of federal funding. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, the SAFER grant for firefighters and mm -hmm. police. Um, we look at counts by jurisdiction, census data. Is there any other things that you want to mention that census data would impact in terms of us uh, gaining uh, benefit from federal funding? Uh, Medicaid, uh, Medicare Part D, Part B, uh, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, Highway Planning and Construction, Housing Choice Vouchers, State Children's Health Insurance Program, uh, Special Education Grants, Title I Grants to Local Education Agencies, Nutritional Lunch Program, Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, uh, th and I'll do Head Start and Early Head Start. Uh, those are just the programs that bring in over $100 million uh, to the state of Maryland, um, with the exception of Head Start, which was $96 million, but I rounded up. And I'll add that there are 132 different programs that receive federal funding based on census data. So in 2015, $675 billion was distributed to those, it, mm -hmm. those 132 different programs. None of those grants is based on census data. Right. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? We'll open that up for public hearing. Any would like to come forward uh, for public hearing for Resolution 1019? I see Ms. Johnson. Anyone else, please come forward. Julia Johnson, P.O. Box 6634, Annapolis, Maryland. The senior generation who has been working on family history and genealogy, of course, use the, the you know the existing census records. Uh, like we found you know some of our ancestors in Philadelphia in 1699, so that was a big thrill. Um, and so we see the historic and the other you know some other values and importance to collecting the data. However, in the modern era, uh, with the 2010 census, there were a fair number of seniors in my acquaintance who were very upset or concerned about the long form, because the long form asks a great deal of detailed information, including information about your income and other personal information. It's not just the amount of time that it takes, but the fear of the protecting of the data. And so um, you know that cyber, you know, and this of course is all going to be you know, in cyber form. There, there's a great deal of concern about this getting you know, captured by you know, hostile people. And 
combined with that, I don't know if you've had to renew your driver's license re recently, but in my case, I had to obtain, I'd go to the archives to obtain my divorce records to prove that the name on my birth certificate was the right, you know, that I'm, you know, I'm that same person, um, which wasn't perhaps unduly burdensome, you know, like 40 bucks for the records, but I lost about three, the big chunk of three days and so on. And then because I was born out of state, it turns out the out-of-state birth, birth certificate things um, take um, up to a month to, to be mailed back to me. So that was you know, a nip and tuck, even though I started early. Uh, but what really upset me was with that, you know, when I t took it to get my driver's license, they scanned Please summarize, Ms. Johnson. And so they have my family's records going back 100 years stored. Not that I'm 100, but they got my parents. You know, anyway, so they go way back. And it, that alarmed me about the amount of data and how good is their cybersecurity. So, Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Appreciate it. Everybody should do it, but Okay, Madam Secretary, could you please read the title of resolution number 1019? Resolution number 1019, resolution encouraging participation by Anne Arundel County residents in the United States Census Bureau's 2020 census. Okay, we do have some further discussion, Mr. Uh, Councilman Bulky. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I did have a question for the administration. So I, as I understand it, the application process for this uh, grant through the Maryland State Department of Planning required that the application, which was due March the 1st, 2019, had an approved budget um, notation for where funds will come from. I've not had an opportunity to see the application or the funding source that the administration is using for that. Um, would that be possible that we could get that? I believe we sent the information to Madam Auditor. Um, and I believe it's from existing funds. Okay. Can Madam Auditor uh, speak if to we, that? If, if okay. we don't have it, I, I'm happy to provide it. Okay. Uh, while she's looking, just once again, though, this resolution is not um, an endorsement of any particular grant. Uh, understood, understood. While we're waiting, can I ask Yes, Councilwoman Harris. When you, <laughs> while we're you. waiting for the auditor, sure. Uh, when you say existing funds, you mean funds that were already budgeted this year but have Correct. not been otherwise used, so it, not affecting the next fiscal budget? Um, that is my understanding. Okay. Mr. Chair. Yes. Maybe the twenty-five thousand wouldn't affect the current budget, but the twenty thousand of work that's going to be done by the county employee would likely impact the next fiscal year budget, the one that we're going to do in May and through June. Am I am I missing that? Because that's where the work's actually probably going to take place is in the next budget, at least maybe even further budgets than that. Very, very likely, okay. and those would be executive department employees. Sure. I guess while we're on it, I have another question. Is yeah. it typical for the administration to provide an application like this when coming to the council and sort of asking for a blessing on a, a grant request? Would that be a typical way of doing things? I mean, again, we're we're not asking for a blessing on okay. any particular grant application. The the uh, resolution is requesting uh, the council support efforts to increase participation in the census. We, I guess, and, and this I say respectfully, but what's the need for the resolution then if this is what's going to happen already? I'm unclear on why it is that the council is being asked. It feels like a blessing in a way. I don't understand why you're at, you would be asking us. I mean, I, I think it's an important public policy statement that citizens of Anne Arundel County uh, participate in the uh, census. It, just to give, while we're, while we're waiting uh, and fill some time, uh, the census count does begin April 1st, 2020, is when uh, I believe the federal government actually starts counting. Um, if I'm not mistaken. And so that would, um, 
we would be supporting efforts up through there. So to your earlier point, um, county employees would be intended that they would be doing some sort of PR, even if it's just as simple as Councilwoman Pickard said, send in a few tweets. I mean, our president does it all the time. Yeah, but it's not twenty thousand dollars to do that. Oh, I bet you that costs a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was just going to respond. As long as we're, as long as the administration understands and agrees that a vote tonight in no way endorses uh, or even prohibits up, us from later rejecting spending of the county money, as long as that's the administration's position, they understand that. I, and I believe the Office of Law would confirm that the uh, uh, resolution doesn't bind you to any particular grant. Okay, thank you. Madam Auditor. Yes, um, so as far as the um, <laughs> application was from Anne Arundel County Youth um, Partnership Children. Um, and so what they're asking for is to pay for certain salaries of those people and they provided the resume. Um, and what they're doing as far as the match would be a county executive staff liaison for 20000 And the other is contractual services, development of advertising, printing of advertising, translation services for printed material and other advertising costs. But it doesn't say like from which budget, but it may have been from the Anne Arundel County Youth and Partnership. I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, when I, I asked the question, yeah, I mean, we can we can definitely find out. When I asked the question, it, it was it, within existing resources. Okay. Councilman Volke, do you still? I do. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, I guess with that, so if we don't have all the information on this tonight, then I would ask, I'd make a motion that we hold this over so that we can take it up when we do have all the information. Uh, if if it's appropriate. Go ahead. Uh, we, uh, we don't have a second, though. Let, let's do that first. Okay. Is there a second on Councilman, Councilman Volke's um, motion? Sure, I'll second it. Okay. Administration? I, I would ask that the council reject that um, motion. I think, again, the resolution does not bind the county to any particular grant. Um, I believe there's more than enough information regarding what the 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 grant even uh, would entail. Um, so I, I would request that um, we get to um, promoting the count. And before we go to Councilwoman Lacey, I want to be clear, Mr. Volke, did you have a date on when uh, this would be held till? Again, I'd say the next okay. meeting. I think or that's enough time. Councilwoman are you amenable to that? Second, okay. Yes. Uh, Councilwoman Lacey? I move to call the vote on the resolution. However, that's appropriate, our parliamentarian okay, well, we, can. My understand my understanding is we have a pending motion on the floor, which has been properly moved and seconded to hold the bill, so we will vote on that first. Okay. If that fails, then we vote on the resolution. So, Madam Secretary, could you please call the roll on holding uh, till the next meeting, resolution 1019. Ms. Pickard. Nay. Mr. Volke. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. I'm sorry. Aye. Thank you. Ms. Rodvian. Nay. Ms. Hare. Aye. Ms. Lacey. Nay. Mr. Prusky. Nay. Three in the affirmative, four in the negative. The motion to hold the vote on resolution number 1019 to the next meeting is defeated. Great, and we're back to the original motion. Councilwoman Lacey, did you want to add anything because you, you had your uh, mic on? No, I just okay. wanted to call gotcha. the vote. Gotcha, thank you. <laughs> okay. So let's call the question, seeing there's no more discussion. Um, Madam Secretary, could you please call the roll on resolution 1019? Ms. Pickard. Aye. Mr. Volke. Nay. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Ms. Hare. Aye. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Mr. Prusky. Aye. Six in the affirmative, one in the negative, resolution number 1019 is adopted. Is there any other business to be brought before the County Council? I don't see any. I don't think anybody wants to stay any longer. Um, may I have a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. Is there a second? <laughs> second. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. The County Council is now adjourned until Monday, April 1st, 2019. Thank you and good evening.